Welcome to the Road Dog Project. This is Don Muskies and my canine co-host, Leon. Thanks to celebrity coaches, we're hitting the road and talking to the pros that make concerts and live events happen. If you'd like to support the channel, we'd appreciate a big thumbs up, and please enjoy the episode. On today's episode, a prominent fixture of the touring production industry in Nashville and beyond, Mr. Kyle Jones. From musician to industry executive, over the years he has served in numerous touring production positions and as a transport executive supporting concert touring nationwide with his own companies and with major vendors, Stage Call, Truck and Roll, and at the time of this recording, VP of Account Development at SES Special Event Services Nashville office managing all aspects of production and transport in conjunction with the Brandhart family of companies. Since this taping, Kyle is now the president of the newest branch of Pioneer Coach heading up their trucking division. To name just a few artists that Kyle has contributed to, Darius Rucker, Ed Sheeran, Carrie Underwood, George Strait, Luke Combs, Doobie Brothers, Rolling Stones, Metallica, The Eagles, and so many more. Always making Texas proud, from Houston and Liberty, Texas, he is the Kyle Jones. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out. Thanks I appreciate for the, it. the accolades there, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> kind of a little uh, reclimped here. Well, we could go on and on. That's yeah. the thing about it. If if yeah. I, if I'm talking to veterans in the industry, you are uh, should be a decorated officer, yeah. just for just for surviving. Yeah, I always reinvent myself a lot. Well, you I, do. Uh, you know you. But I enjoy I enjoy every aspect of production, well, whether it's a, a promoter rep, whether it's a, a guy that's peddling trucking in the entertainment industry, or or doing something else, uh, festivals and or anything to do with the production. I I like all of it. That's how I met you. You're a production manager, sound guy, you know. And and I uh, I don't have a big audio background or lighting background. I, I can run an analog console, but it yeah. comes to digital. I'm dead. Right. Uh, but running one and actually making it sound good enough to keep a job, I couldn't do. But you've been around all aspects of it starting from a musician and I think it's really cool to come from that point of view oh, yeah, too. Yeah. I started off as a player when I was a teenager yeah. and and playing in, in club bands in the Texas area and stuff and uh, had a, enough success to have some fun and then uh, I, I got married at a young age my wife and I met in school our, our parents introduced us when we were 20 and uh, three hours after we met I kissed her then I asked her to marry me and a few days later, it took her long enough to feel sorry for me, and she came back and said yes, and we got married a couple months later. We just celebrated in September our 40th anniversary, and, and definitely, I'm not the catch. My wife, Gail, a lot of the people in the industry know her, and they call her Saint Gail. She's, She's definitely the catch, a good person. And if you're gonna succeed in this business, as a touring person or anybody working at the levels that uh, stress that we work in the music industry, whether you're a touring guy or a or a rep or anything, you're going to have to have a spouse that, that understands what we do and stands by you, you know, and uh, and I, I see, sadly, uh, not as much as some other professions, but I see a lot of uh, relationships that fall apart and all that because they don't, uh, sometimes the women don't marry a guy that's been touring for 10 years and two or three years later upset that he's gone all the time and they knew what he did when they got married. It just, it's a, it's a definitely a learning curve. Everybody in the business knows, uh, with any experience, that uh, relationships is a tough deal. So you give hope to a lot of people. You've been in the business this long, uh, married for 40 years now, and also got engaged only hours after meeting. So yeah. all of that is inspiring and gives a lot of people hope in a lot of different directions. And, and surviving the business and her, her support behind you, I know, is oh, yeah. incredible. And you have two beautiful kids. Two great kids, both work in the music business. I have a son, Jordan, that's a, a LED type video director guy and uh, and works with our company. He went out on Hootie the Blowfish last year and was one of the two directors and took care of the LED systems. I uh, And both of them attended universities that taught music industry things. And my daughter, Lauren, uh, who's uh, sadly will be a Debbie Downer, she's been battling pancreatic cancer for a couple of years, but she was out with Elton John and kind of took care of his dressing room uh, when she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and uh, he was so uh, wonderful to her, such a great guy. Yeah. And so she's been for a couple years battling that, but she's winning and uh, and she's 
back healthy as can be and, awesome. and waiting for COVID to be over so she can go back to work. Awesome. And my wife, just so we've mentioned her, Gail, Absolutely. is retired. Yeah. And uh, she was uh, an accountant, uh, HR type executive and uh, with the Berkshire companies. And so she's retired a few years and, and takes care of the house and helps me do my thing because I don't plan on ever retiring. I understand that. It's, it's uh, you got to keep moving. Got to keep moving. Well, uh, on top of uh, your family life and all of the artists that we can continue to name, I know for some of my Texas people, nothing uh, matters more than the time that you spent uh, working for a guy named George Strait. Yeah, yeah, that's how I met you out with George Strait. Yeah, I was George's stage manager uh, for a while, and uh, quite a while, and had a good time. Still to this day, I can tell you I have not had any more fun or made any more greater friends than the friends like yourself I met you, but yeah. and the people I worked with and George's crew, Stacy LaBarbera, the lighting designer, Paul Rogers, the PM, yeah. uh, Leroy Eichler, George's bus driver, and Jimmy Spivey, the band members, I could sit and name all 11 band members, but those guys are like family to me. Tommy Foote, the road manager, who actually hired George Strait into their band. Tommy Foote and Mike Daly, the steel player, and Terry Hill, the bass player, they had the ace in the whole band. Yeah. They hired George, it's a family organization, treat everybody, like family and so it was a great time i met so many great people that that opened for us especially on the we we did stadiums for about a decade or more but we toured it for four years and, and i met you in 1999 yes right uh on that tour and you were out as production manager for jody messina yeah and uh you and i just hit it off yeah or, you know absolutely people our personalities kind of like the same type of people well on a tour like that too uh for those that haven't done that kind of thing uh, you have uh, several bands and you're doing stadiums and it's like moving a city. Seven bands. Yeah, seven bands. <laughs> and, and it's like moving a city to, an, to another city every night. Yeah. And we don't necessarily ride on the same buses, but we live around each other. We eat around each other and you build uh, relationships like that. And Two 12-hour days or 15, 20-hour days yeah. uh, Saturday and Sunday together for the, for the three or four months that we toured like yeah. that. So you build a lot of relationships on these tours and things like that, and sadly, it be, sometimes it's abrupt when it when it ends. And you and see it, each other at award shows or yeah. something. Some of these touring guys, yeah. I, me being in the the uh, production uh, supply side of the thing now, I get to see a lot more people. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you see them at award shows, normally, but I see people around town, or if I'm in L.A. or New York or something, yeah. or one of the other areas, Atlanta, I go see people that I know. Yeah. Man, when we were touring, I was I was the last two weeks or so man I was hating life couldn't wait to get off a tour and, and fast forward we get off a tour and two weeks later I'm calling going when are we going out again yeah yeah I can't oh, yeah. stay at home you know and it's uh, well, and you know, everybody that's listening that's toured they'll know that because we all have that disease and it's the need to do what we do you that's know? why I'm doing this I had to get them back on a bus this is the yeah. only way I could do it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and fortunately enough for me I've been been uh, with uh, with our company musical coaches which are yeah. a friendly uh, competitor with celebrity we get along very very well they do a lot for us and uh, I've been uh, tossed into the fire and so I've been heavily involved in our buses so I've learned a lot about them this year and yeah. uh, and moving them and driving them and doing things with them. I drove a presidential candidate for a few days this year, oh, so nice. it's pretty interesting, the, the different things. I'm reinventing myself, like Ab I said. Absolutely. Well, I was going to say, the now that you're with SES and all those uh, partner companies, it is s seriously a one-stop production empire. You can An artist could call up and get everything in the world when typically they would call a bus company they would call a sound and light company or separate sound and lighting companies and a video company and a trucking company but if they wanted to start from scratch they could call make one phone call to you and and get everything yeah <laughs> if they're, you know it's, it's it is and and we have several uh, a handful of clients that we do everything for them and, and we have some that we may do two or three things for them. They may have a relationship with one, uh, uh, an audio company or a lighting company or something different than them. But we have like Luke Combs, we do 100% of his production. Yeah, yeah. You know, and most of the employees on his tour are our, our employees, with yeah. exception of those that work directly for him. Right. And it's a wonderful experience. But we do lights, sound, uh, video, rigging, barricades, buses, and trucks. Yeah. And that's, and that's you know, that's... Um, it's a, a great thing, but it's a fluke that it you know that'll last forever. You know, relationships and and productions change and stuff. And we're not so naive to think that we're gonna 
all of a sudden be the the end all know all for doing this and we haven't other people have done it and tried it we right. we just uh <clears throat> over the years absorbing and purchasing some of these other companies or starting most of these companies from scratch did it so that we would be diversified and, and rounded in the music industry that's why it was done uh, jim brammer and his partners uh jeff cranfield and jason farah nevin cleach on the g2 side and and, and all the, those folks they've they've always uh, had the attitude that it's, being diverse is a good thing absolutely so uh ceo and director of touring is mr brammer Jim Brammer. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, he's more the CEO and all that. His uh on the SES side, his son Michael Brammer. Okay. Who's a up and coming executive and okay. now a partner in the company. Michael's okay. the director of touring okay. for the SES side and all that and, and grew up as a from a little boy. Yeah. You know, it he's uh in his late twenties, but grew up as a little boy in this business and now he's a grown man and, and uh has got SES at the helm. He's basically uh, there with Jeff Cranfield and Jason and those guys and, and helping run the company and uh, and definitely knows what he's doing. You yeah. know, and he's learning. Yeah. Hopefully he's going to learn some more marketing and sales skills from me and stuff. And, and uh, that's my specialty is, yeah. is account managing and taking care of these clients and, yeah. and, and helping find their needs and stuff. And my, but he's doing a great job. Uh, yeah. The companies have grown under his his work as a sales guy, yeah. but we all have room to gr grow. You know, I've learned a lot about business this year, just through Jim and Tom Moriarty, uh, the CEO of our trucking division, special about transportation. Tom has taught me a lot this year. Valerie, uh, our uh, Shelly, our, our operations manager, she's taught me a lot this year. We and we, it's a it's a family atmosphere. And don't get me wrong, at Stage Call there was there was somewhat of a family atmosphere yeah. and all that. Yeah. But this place takes the family thing to a little bit different level. Awesome. And uh, and uh, it's been fantastic. That's it's awesome. Been a, it's been a year and it's been great. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are thinking about retiring at my age. Uh, my best friend who got me in this business, I'm sure you were going to get to Steve Lawler yeah. at some point anyway. A Absolutely. lot of people know Steve. Yeah. Steve is a, a Live Nation rep. Steve and I share the same birthday. He gave me my first job in this business on the production side and, and I tutored me. Yeah. And I just learned by yeah. his, his stuff. You know, I, I, I didn't know anything. Right. I was I was totally ignorant of the production side. And, yeah. and so I learned from him and other people. I learned from you. You learn from people. And, uh, and you need to be a sponge when you're out here. If you're, a young, if you're a young touring type or somebody thinking about this industry, there's nothing that you can do. You can get an education in this at some school or full sale or, yeah. or Berkeley or Middle Tennessee State University. But more than anything, just being a sponge yeah. when you're out on tour and learning the whole tour. Don't just learn your lighting or your audio or video. Be a sponge and learn yeah. what everybody else does. It'll help you in the end. I always recommend anybody new to take any sort of job, whether it's assistant or merchandise person or whatever, if they get an opportunity to get on the road, because from that position, you can watch all these other departments and see what's going on there. And you, you might you might already have a goal in mind as to what you want to do, whether it's audio or lighting or video or things like that, but you can get around it and not be responsible for it and see what really happens, because uh, as much as uh, there's a lot of... Uh, education now a lot of uh, places that have music business and all kinds of uh, uh, you know music industry courses uh, getting out on the road and absorbing it and seeing it what for what it really is and not getting enough sleep and uh, yeah. going through those long hours and things like that that's the education that's where you're really going to learn from and uh, that's a big part of it is just the stamina to deal with it so let's let's talk about the Kyle Jones store let's go back Go, let's go back to Liberty, Texas, and let's talk about um, where you uh, did you play an instrument? Yeah, I was, I was a, a, a wannabe guitar player, and you know, and, and I was a, I, I uh, always wanted to be a rock star well, while you were in high school. This, oh, yeah, started Man, when I wanted to be. I, and I, listen, I was the class clown comedian in my class, Hard I would always take one for the team, you know, <laughs> and uh. And, and you know, and uh, I remember our, our biology teacher said, "Who came up with the theory of asexual reproduction?" And he looked at me, Jones, because I was talking, and I said, "Your wife," you know, and uh, and so that I got beat for that, you know. And so I was, but I always wanted to be on a stage. But I tried stand-up comedy one time, 
and it was the most traumatic experience being up oh my god it's like you're standing there nude yeah, yeah, but yeah. when you got a band around you and you're in a band or something which I, I did it you know yeah, multiple yeah. times yeah. it's a lot more fun so so my my band days we played all over the place you know and uh, it didn't end it. And, and I you got, sang too. Right? I saw, yeah, front, wrote the songs a lot of times and, and did stuff, and it was really fun. Is but this when, while you were still in high school or after high you graduated? High school and after high school. And so, and then, then so it kind of fell apart, the last band. It kind of, kind of imploded, kind of like that movie, That Thing You Do. We just kind of imploded the last band or two. And, and, uh, and I met Gail. And then suddenly, me being a band wasn't important anymore. Right, right. And, and so, uh, get an education doing things like that or whatever but I, I started working and then I, I was in the heavy equipment business believe it or not a lot of guys have, uh, that tour a lot have used Sun Belt or whatever and I, and I went to work for Hertz Equipment Rental and I, and I stayed with them up to a few years and then I moved over to a local company in Houston and I was a I ended up being like a production provider I mean I would provide stuff all over the country for these tours and I kind of specialized in stadium tours well I was doing um, Pace Concerts out of Houston which ended up becoming Live Nation uh, Pace Concerts had a Pace Motorsports division. A guy named C. E. Altman uh, was one of the partners with Sidney Schlinker and, and Mr. Becker, Mr. Alan Becker, who's still alive. Good man, and Brian and Gary Becker, his sons, good people, great family. So I was doing, providing like the dirt equipment for in the Astrodome or Back the Cotton Rose. Bowl or something, yeah. all the stuff to build the dirt tracks for monster trucks or Supercross. Right. And one day I was out there and. and C.E. Altman said, you know, you need to meet my friend who uh, is in the concert division. I said, well, they don't rent backholds and bulldozers. He goes, no, but they rent forklifts, light towers, and generators. Yeah, scaffolding. And so you need to meet this guy named Steve Lawler. Yeah. Well, I'd heard kind of his name. Yeah. So I, I set up an appointment. I went and met with him, and it come to find out one of his real good friends, Scotty Lieber, God rest his soul, Scotty died of cancer 20 years ago. We were on tour when Scotty passed away. But um, Scotty used to come watch my band. You know, and so when he, when, when Steve, he was, at, I was with Steve somewhere and Scotty walked in, oh my God, you know, and you know each other. So it's kind of that six degrees. Sure. So I, I got hooked up with Steve and we just hit it off. And yeah. listen, it, he's hard to get in with. He's, he's, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's tough to, yeah. to crack and, and for him to trust you and stuff. And, sure. and he's had some people that have been around him for years and some yeah. of them come and go. But for some reason, 35 years later, yeah. you know, I'm still around uh i haven't pissed him off enough and plus my wife does his taxes so but, but you try <laughs> you try to piss him off Yo, know, i try like hell to piss him <laughs> off but it just uh you know only one time he told me to go to the hotel and then an hour later realized he had to do my job while i was gone so he sent a runner to pick me up <laughs> oh my god that was in uh in uh raleigh north carolina the university there but anyway yeah we, we've got along real well i i yeah. i uh it's wonderful. Some of my best stories in the world were with him. A lot of uh, a lot of tours together and that yeah. sort of thing. And I and and uh, going oh. back to George Strait and everything else that we did. Oh, George uh, Strait and you. You guys would uh, be in the production office together. And just recently, that you uh, well, it's been not too long ago. There was a po picture of you and him. And I and I said, you guys need to put that picture in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A sitting side by side yeah, yeah, in the production yeah, office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, you see me sitting there. That's because when somebody calls on the radio, say, "Hey, Steve Lawler, we need towels in this dress room down here." He Kyle. looks at me. He goes, "We'll be right there." You know, we did a we did a Fourth of July festival, thirty mm -hmm. something years ago, in Houston. It was called. Uh, uh, anyway, I don't know what it was called, but they had the Buffalo Bio runs right through downtown Houston, the famous bio that floods. Yeah, yeah. And we set up some travel trailers on one side and a stage, and then on the other side were all the fans, 50, 60,000 fans, you know, yeah. for this 4th of July thing in the middle of the summer in Houston, hotter than hell, humidity level, I mean, gold bond to keep your <laughs> testicles from sticking to your legs permanently. And we... Uh, were set up there, and every time somebody called on the radio for something, Steve looked at me, and finally after about three days, I said, are you ever gonna come out of this, you know, you ever gonna come out of this trailer? And he goes, what do I have you for, you know? And he stayed in that trailer, because yeah. Steve is, you know, fair skin and red haired, and he sunburns real easy, plus he doesn't like to sweat, and if it involves work, you know, <laughs> at 69 years old. Of course, back then he was in his 40s. Right. But, um, and another funny story from that festival is we got a call on radio, uh, that there was something was going on up front and we had let a few fans up front 
in front of the stage so the artist wasn't just singing all the way 150 yards across the bayou. So we had, we let 50 or 100 fans across and, and we get up there and there's this young girl, probably in her 20s, she kept flashing Clint Black. And she was flashing Clint Black, her boobs. And the security guard came up and told her to quit it. So I called Bobby Jones, who ran Five Star or whatever it was called, uh, uh, security there in right. Houston, and he came up and all that. And I said, "See that guy there?" And so he, the girl did it, and the guy stopped her again. And I said, "What's the farthest area that y'all are doing security for?" And he said, "Well, the American General parking lot, about two miles in the road." I said, "Send that guy there. <laughs> it's the police job to tell her we don't stop them. Yeah, We're yeah. out here in 103 degrees. If they want to flash, that's the only fun we have." <laughs> Lawler agreed. So anyway, that's a funny story for that one. But yeah, Excellent. we go back a long way. After Pace and all that stuff, uh, you started one of your own trucking companies. Well, I, yeah, I started a production company during, I, I quit working for a heavy equipment company and started my own production provider company. Okay. And I would provide a lot of production assistance for, and we were doing festivals. I specialize in festivals and stadiums and yeah. stuff. And so I got forklifts and and pallet jacks and chairs and, yeah. and and you know all kinds of hampers and storage things and I had all the little production of things that, that when a tour comes in or a festival comes in they need extra stuff sure and I owned a lot of that and bought a lot of that stuff and we did that and then in the uh, 90s about the same time special event transportation was starting their company Jim was starting that I started a trucking company called Showquip okay and uh, and, and bought a fleet of trucks right off the bat. Within the first couple of years, I was up to 25 or 30 trucks. Wow. The first, I bought 10 right off the bat. Wow. And uh, and I and I had, of course, George Strait's tour, John Michael Montgomery, the Dixie Chicks, uh, Boston, uh, some small Little River Band. You know, yeah. we had some yeah. other acts and yeah. Kenny Chesney when he he was my first truck. I had his first truck rather. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Jody Messina. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of those different ones. So it was really fun. And, uh, and I ran that thing, but it was just a lot of work. And there's certain things back then, I was in my 30s, I wasn't quite mature enough and business smart enough. And so in the first couple of years, we lost two or $3 million. And uh, till I, my wife came aboard and helped me straighten out my mistakes and, and figured it out. So then we sold the company and that's when I stayed on board with Stage Call. And I've been com commuting back and forth from Texas. Yeah. And uh, had a condo in Nashville because yeah. I was signing a lot of Nashville acts and working with a lot of people, rock acts and country acts yeah. that work out of Nashville. So I finally, con uh, I didn't convince. I begged my wife to move there to here to Nashville, and she wouldn't do it. And then because uh, my parents were elderly and her mom was still alive yeah. and elderly, and yeah. uh, but our son came to Nashville at uh, Murfreesboro and went to Middle Tennessee State University. He wasn't there just a semester maybe, and I came home one day. And she goes, "We're moving to Nashville." My baby's too far away right, and so right, the for right. sale sign went up on our place and uh and we sold and packed up and moved and we've been here uh, we've lived in three homes in 40 years of marriage and yeah. this one we've lived in it 16 years wow. 12 and the other two and that's nice this is home now we're never leaving middle uh, tennessee we're, but you still home. have some family in texas yeah i have a sister in texas and she's been up here for three years us getting her healthy but she's back in texas in houston area yeah. And then I have cousins and things like that, but no, and my and we, uh, my wife, all of her older siblings are now gone, uh, but we have you know uh, nieces and nephews and things like that, but no no parents or none of that. Yeah, yeah. No grandparents, they're all gone. So then, uh, for 15 years, stage call. Yeah. And then 15 great years yeah. till the end. And then uh, truck and roll for a minute. That was yeah, starting yeah, that uh, division. They have oh, a what, a what a wonderful man, yeah. uh, Gislaine Arsenault. I can't I can't say enough yeah. about Gislaine. Uh, so so when Stage Call sold to some younger employees, at a, at a point it came to where my it was uh, yeah. time for me to move on. So I moved on. Uh, I had a non compete. <clears throat> yeah. That ended, and so. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't ready to stop and really couldn't afford to stop. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, yeah. you make a lot of money, but you spend a lot of money. Sure. But, um, and just Lane was such a wonderful person to get involved with. And he uh, is a Canadian Montreal uh, citizen and his company's been in business 30 plus years up in Montreal and well respected in the music industry. I mean, big, big tours from, from Janet Jackson to... Uh, Beyonce, I can't name all the big right. major acts that they do, but they do a lot of work. And so he wanted to to diversify and open up a U.S. division. So we partnered up and opened up a U.S. division, and uh, and that operated well. And uh, 
But then this opportunity came up with me, and he and I had a nice long discussion. And uh, and I, after six months, took this position yeah. that I'm on now, which I had been talking to him since day one of yeah. leaving Stage Call. Yeah. It just took a year yeah. to put it together and all. And so I made the move. It was a, a very amicable feel. He calls me once a month. Yeah, I call yeah. him once yeah. a month or something. Yeah. Uh, I have nothing but good thing to say. Some of the best drivers I've ever seen in my life work for his company. They're Canadian citizens. Yeah. Anybody that's ever toured with Truck and Roll will tell you their drivers are their greatest assets. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so good company. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. uh, then I landed over here where I'm at now, and it's been the yeah. best experience of my life. Yeah. I've never worked with a group of people from Tom Moriarty, the CEO of the trucking division, who he came from Roadway, and then he owned another company, and Roadway's one of the largest in the trucking industry. So he had a great education. He just had, had never worked in the music industry. Right. So he's uh, he's been there about four or five years. What little bit he learned from the Brammers and stuff he's learned uh, on on the job you know and he's been out and learned a little bit from me so that company's growing and uh ses uh the light yeah. sound video company so let's talk about in in all the things that you've done uh some of the times that you've uh had to uh, uh work your extreme versatility as a promoter rep um I know that at one point you were out uh, repping for the Southern Gospel Gaither Vocal Band. <laughs> oh, so Steve Lawler calls me. We move into our house here in Tennessee 16 years ago mm -hmm. on the 9th of October. That night at about 8 p.m., he goes, what are you doing? How's it going? If you know Steve Lawler, it's, how's it going? <laughs> no, we're moving in the house. He goes, I need a favor. Oh, no. I go, okay, what do you need, Steve? He goes, well... I'm not going to drop the guy's name because he's a wonderful guy, but there was a guy out on the Gaither tour that had piercings and tattoos and by the end of the evening never wore a shirt and when the building gave the promoter rep a bottle of booze would be chugging it and it didn't work on the Gaithers and nor did the profanity, which I'm, hey, I'm, right. I'm, a, I'm a profanity yeah. laced person too, but I know when and where. Yeah. And, uh, and so he goes, I need you to go. I said, well, sure, let me get all moved and settled. Well, I need you to be on a plane at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Steve Gale's going to kill me. And so he dangled some cash out there. And, yeah, yeah. and so I jumped on it, you know, told yeah. Gail she could have all the extra money. There you go. And so uh, I jumped on it, went out there for a while, and it was uh, quite an experience. And it was, hey, it was great. I, I uh, made some great friends out there. Yeah. Uh, three of the best singers ever in my life I've ever yeah. seen were yeah. out there on that tour. Yeah. And Bill himself was a character. Yeah. Just watching him do his hair every day. Oh my God, it was a two hour experience of him. It's an art in itself. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Donald Trump has nothing on him at doing the fix up of the hair. Yeah. Bill Gaither's has done way different. But then from there, uh, then you were out next the following week with Metallica. Yeah, yeah. Now you go so, here to there. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just one extreme to the other. It's it's from yeah, gospel. Just, yeah, gospel, gospel to whatever. That's what a promoter rep does, though. You yeah. know, and uh, you just go do it, and you and it's uh, and I enjoy the promoter rep is real fun. It's a good job because you know you get to you get to it's a well rounded thing, and you meet a lot of people. Well, and I met all my friends doing the promoter work. Everything that you do, you have to be a people person, and that's why you're Gotta versatile be. like that. You yeah. Know? Got to be a people person. Not everybody. And I not, love, uh, you know, and uh, yeah. my wife, when we go to the grocery store, and my dad's name was Nolan Jones, and my dad was like me. He didn't meet a stranger. He would talk to anybody, and my wife will be in the store somewhere, and I'll be talking to a complete stranger, and she'll look over and go, come on, Nolan, <laughs> you know, and, and call me, you know. Yeah. And uh, But I like people. Absolutely. I, I want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I hold, I remember uh, uh, we were out on tour somewhere, and we were walking into a building uh, at a, somewhere to airport or something and I held the door for these Muslim ladies because they were dressed in their hebab and and, and, I, and I held the door for them and this friend of mine kind of a southerner you know he goes yeah. what'd you do that for I said because they're ladies he goes, yeah but they're Muslim I said yeah but my father didn't tell me to hold the door for Catholics mm -hmm. and Baptists only he said yeah. hold the door yeah. for ladies yeah you know and so I, I like people yeah I uh, I last yeah. year I met a guy about eight. My sister was in town. I told, we talked about her, and she was very sick. She had cancer of her kidney. She had a heart failure, and she had six months of surgery to get her back and, uh, and yeah. going normal. And I met this guy that was parking cars at Vanderbilt University Hospital in his late 30s, early 40s, and he was from Iraq, from Tikrit in yeah. northern Iraq. He wow. was a, he was a, from up in that area, yeah. and uh, we just hit it off. But what I noticed because I was there a lot was that the people that he worked with 
whether they were white, African American, Mexican, it didn't matter, they treated him badly. And so just one day I'd had enough of it and I climbed on two or three of them personally. Yeah. Because I'd found out that they didn't know because yeah. he didn't talk about it. But he was an inter- he was an attorney, number one, before he came here. Yeah. And he was an interpreter on General Petraeus' staff wow. over there. And he yeah. saved a lot of lives. I got to meet a couple of guys that were officers that, that he worked under. Yeah. Then I read letters from Petraeus and other people. This guy was a lifesaver. And yeah. he and his family were marked for death by Al-Qaeda. You know, and so he gave up his life in Iraq for our nation, yeah. to help our nation. So he moved over here. And, of course, if you speak Farsi or whatever they speak, you know, it's hard to translate into American and be an attorney here. So right now he's an employee of Vanderbilt and he parks cars. And and, uh, and it's an honorable job, you know, sure. and he does it with a smile. Yeah. And he's a wonderful human being. Well, fast forward, he was getting his U.S. citizenship last year, a year ago in about August. Yeah. And a couple months out, he called me and said, I want you to be the person that sponsors me. And I would be honored if you were the person there yeah. when I took the oath. Wow. So uh, Gail and I went down, and, and Gail ended up having to leave, and his wife uh, and son were there, but they don't speak great English until they get the English language down. They can't take the yeah. citizenship. Yeah. So they had to leave, and so it was just he and I. Yeah. And it was like a father and a son, even though we're not that far apart in age, but watching him take the oath and all yeah. and what i'm trying i know i'm on my soapbox here That's but just okay. love people absolutely you know and if you're working our business and you don't love people you're in the wrong business i think let's hit a couple of uh some uh legends some uh stories that okay. get passed around uh on george Strait. there's a lot of after party stories oh man tell, tell me about those oh yeah oh george you know we uh george Strait. first place louis louis messina is world-renowned promoter rep talent buyer. He's built the careers of, of course, George Strait, Kenny Chesney, Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift, you name it, Louis put him on the map. And he just has that, Louis, ha- and he is a wonderful guy. Yeah. Those, those of you who yeah. don't know Louis, but he's a great guy. He gives a lot. He's helped so many people. Uh, I think about the people that work for his company, the Messina Group. He's, you know, he's given these people the reins to, to make it and go, you know, Kate and Rome and, and all the guys. Uh, just a wonderful company. But anyway, so Louis put this thing together, and we were on the road and all that. And, and he wanted George to, you know, the whole concept is, is if George and Norma aren't having fun, we're not going to keep doing this. Right. And so we wanted the atmosphere ever not to be like home. So we built two complete identical systems of furniture. And we always had a tent because it was we we're playing football stadiums. And if you get into the dressing rooms, they're yeah. so bland. Locker rooms. They stink. Yeah. You know, and so we would have a nice, nice heated or air conditioned tent, whatever we needed. And we had identical rugs and wet bars yeah. and karaoke machines and furniture. We had two identical sets of ca- different couches and chairs and things. And so, and it made it fun. And we had some great, great parties and stuff. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun. But what did you, there was, there was times that you had to, to entertain. Oh yeah, oh yeah, every time you know. But if I went in there and mixed me a cocktail, that meant we were done loading out the stagehands. We we'd keep a handful of stagehands on the load out the furniture, and that was just kind of my signal because I made the mistake once of saying, "Hey guys, we need to shut the party down and come on." And George looking at me and saying, "Who's writing the check for this?" I said, "That would be you. Just don't forget it." Yeah, there so you never go. again did I come in and tell them to shut the party down. Yeah. So, but I would come in and mix a cocktail. Well, one night we were playing in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and they had the tent going, and Alan Jackson's wife had, had flown home on his plane. He had a King Air <laughs> turboprop, and, and George was going to drop Alan off back in Nashville on his way back to San Antonio. And so I go in the tent, and it's George and Norma, Alan Jackson, uh, Ray Benson from Sleep at the Wheel, Leanne Womack, uh, a few other. I can't remember who all was in there, but they're all in their karaoke. And Tony Stevens was Alan Jackson's tour manager at the time, and he, like me, was an adult on board. They were all having a good time. And, uh, but some song came up, and I looked, and Tony was singing. And they got finished, and somebody said, Who was that singing? They, Alan pointed at Tony. He said, It's my tour manager, Tony. He said, See, George, he's a better singer than you. So fast forward three or four songs, and I was standing back by the DJ, and he started playing Only Make Believe by Conway Twitty, and I always thought I was a Conway Twitty imitator. Oh, there you go. So, and I had a wired mic and not wireless, so it was a little hotter, you know, and and so I start uh, bulking out, you know, the, uh-huh. the song, and, and they're all looking around and looking around for about a minute and a half. I was like, who the heck is that? Because they can hear it in the monitors. Yeah. 
And finally, Norma looks back. Were you off the stage or something? Were no, I was behind him. <laughs> so Norma looks back. She goes, oh, it's Kyle. And the song, it didn't see. George goes, see, my stage manager's better than you, Alan Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good time. It was always, you know, the, it, 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 there was a lot of fun amongst everybody. And they treated, you know, uh, I dressed up in a one-piece 1920s swimming suit because I had insulted George, so he claimed it was a joke. I insulted him about his tennis shoes, and so the next week, everywhere was a picture of me with a circle and a line through it that said, <laughs> Kyle Free Zone. And they had him everywhere, and the tent was one. So I walked in to tell him we were done, and George yeah. said, oh, you can't come in here. <laughs> you know, it was Kyle Free Zone, and so right. finally he threw this one, everybody was dressed in the Roaring Twenties. Oh, that was, it had a motif every night. Right, right. Well, George never got, he was not going to put on a one-piece bathing suit from Atlantic City, you know the guys? Yeah, yeah. So he throws it to me. If you wear this, you can come back in the tent. Well, I wanted to end the Kyle Free Zone. I was missing a lot of the fun. So I go on the bus and I'm putting it on. Of course, I'm six foot four. George is five seven. So it fit like one of those those mankinis the guys a, wear. A, a swimsuit. Yeah, one piece swimsuit. But it looked like one of those one piece bikinis guys are wearing. Right. You see advertising that no man would ever wear. So I put it on and I go in there. And uh, oh, I remember I put it on and Paul was on the bus. And I stuck some tube socks in the front. Paul said, don't do that. You'll embarrass Norma and the ladies. So I took it out. So I walk in there, and it was pretty cold. And there was a <laughs> chief. There was a chief of one of the Indian nations there. We were in Albuquerque. Soon as I walked in, Norma says, it looks like it's cold outside, Kyle. Then I wish I would have had the tube socks. <laughs> but it was fun. what I'm saying is it was a family. It was a fun atmosphere. People had fun. And that's yeah. why it continued you so don't, long. You don't, do, you don't do that kind of stuff when you don't. A lot of tours don't have that kind of fun. Absolutely. I mean, the Dixie Chicks uh, in there having a, we had a bachelorette party for one of the, Emily and the Dixie Chicks when she was marrying Charlie Robinson back in the day. And, you know, and Tim McGraw having a lot of fun with Tim and Faith and all those people. Yeah, they, there's a lot of fun out there and camaraderie on the tour. And, and he just kind of, uh, you know, commands that. Yeah. I, I remember ringing in the PA, Brad Irving was ringing in the PA one Sunday and George would arrive. He would fly in Friday night to the Saturday show We'd do Saturday. He would only ride the bus one day a week, and that was Saturday to Sunday. And then Sunday morning, we'd have a sedan there for him or a Suburban or something to take him to a hotel to spend the day. Sure. But we definitely didn't wake him up. That's right. when they woke up on the bus. Sure. Well, Brad's mm -hmm. ringing in the PA to um, Momstein. What's the band called? Ingvay? Romstein. Oh, Romstein. Yes, and you know how loud that is, guys. If you're not in, the, it's pretty heavy. And George is asleep on the bus? George and Norma asleep on the bus, and it's, I mean, it's 110 dB. That prism system from Shoko was thumping about that time the walkie-talkie comes on on that channel and it's all had a you know between he and I and he goes Kyle I go yes I knew who it was he goes what is that I said that would be us ringing in the PA with Rom stand he goes never let that happen again <laughs> which means no more of that kind of music <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but it was it was it was a fun way it oh was, yeah, you know, yeah it wasn't uh, never a mean moment on that tour no no so before we get done here uh, you have a long history with animals Oh, so tell me about now. You had, you had at one point you had seven, nine, nine. At one point we had nine rescue dachshunds in our house, and we don't, we Dotsons. don't, we don't, uh, we don't. Uh, what do they call that when you? Um, we keep them. We adopt them. Yeah, we yeah, don't, yeah, we you, don't, you don't foster. Right, right. We don't foster because we're, we're the world's worst foster. I couldn't do that. Yeah, I had one person. One of the ones we have now. They said, "Will you foster it for a week or so? Do we find somebody?" And in fact, you know, our first four, you know, a bunch of those, but but. We, uh, we ended up with nine of them in our home, perfectly house trained, we clean, we bathe them like you wouldn't believe. But uh, over the past three years, the original four that we had, they made it to 17 years old, almost every one of them. Man. And they've moved on and we're down to the youngest four, which two of them are around the 15 age now. Yeah, yeah. One of them's 10 and one of them's eight. Yeah. And, uh, but, but they but they become part of your family. Oh, they're part of our family. Yeah. We take care of them. When we had nine of them, we were spending about twenty five thousand dollars a year just in medical. We love them. That's unconditional. I always tell people if you wonder who loves you more, your dog or your spouse, lock your wife in the trunk of your car with the dog in yeah. the middle of the summer yeah. and come back in an hour and see which one's happy to see you, the dog. <laughs> you know, and uh, and the dog they're they're a, they're a big part of my life. Well, big part of my life and my wife's life, and she's she's so giving and caring and. And, and I know people think we're silly about our dogs, but our children grow up and move on, and they love us still, but they move on and have their own lives, you know? Well, and, and these dogs are so much a part of our life. They're the best companions, and we can learn a lot. Yeah, as we stand right here yeah. at Leon, my yeah, buddy he, Leon, who's he's, here, well, he's, he's over us. He's, he's not impressed with our conversation. No, he, 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 <laughs> he 
goes, where are you going to eat next? <laughs> it's like, when is this over? So uh, before we go, I wanted to talk a little bit about your office is at the Soundcheck facility. For those people that uh, are not familiar outside the business or haven't been to Nashville, st- we were talking about our community here. A lot of it is centered around that facility. Yeah, Soundcheck is a rehearsal facility and a storage facility in the music industry. And they have them on the East Coast and the West Coast. They have these facilities. But this place has been around a long time. It was started back in the 90s by Glenn Fry and, and Bob Thompson, who was a production manager for the Eagles. Right. And uh, and and they called him Norton because his father was actually... Uh, 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 Norton from... Uh, yeah, from the, the, the Honeymooners. Honeymooners. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carney. Anyway, yeah. so Art Carney. So anyway, but um, so that's where it is. And Ben Jumper bought the place in 2003, July of 03, and called me. And I was living in Texas saying, man, you got to be up here. Yeah. So that's when I set my sights on wanting to move here and have an office at Soundcheck. So I had an office uh, for 15 years in the main building. And then back in January, we built new offices for us for uh, at the facility because it's a place to be. It's, you know, it's when you're developing relationships with up and coming acts and people that are, and they're in and out of there constantly, whether in their lockers or at some other vendor picking up microphones, batteries, guitar strings, what they're doing. So there's yeah. a lot of chance for everybody to see each other. Yeah. Come by, if you're in town, come by that 740 building at Soundcheck and we can uh, espresso up some coffee, have some coffee, have a beer, whatever you want to do, we got it. Absolutely. And sit and visit, man. It's a great place to hang. Yeah, you've got uh, one of the best uh, green rooms around in your office, uh, connected to your office there for uh, having guests uh, uh, entertain yeah. or whatever. It is, it is very comfortable and very pinball cool. Pinball machine, yeah. an old electromagnetic pinball, 1972. There's a Miss Pac-Man machine. There's a full-size skee-ball machine. Nice. A, a jukebox from the 80s full of all kinds of 80s yeah. CDs and stuff. Uh, Art Deco 1950s refrigerator. And there's an espresso machine. There's couches, chairs, yeah. uh, theatrical lighting, and right. big screen TV. So it's just a good vibe and hang. I've had you know, different artists hang out in there to do their interviews and things, and they like it. It's a good place to hang, Absolutely. visit and talk business, talk about life. So, Kyle, uh, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, we're, we're almost back to Soundcheck to drop you off. Um, anytime I've ever needed anything, I'm, I'm able to call you, whether it's for a company that you're working with or not, and you're always a big help. If you don't know uh, how to answer or know what I need, you know somebody that does, and you always connect me, and uh, you're one of the very highly respected peoples in this, people in this business, and for very good reason. Um, And uh, for the listeners, if you are in Nashville and you find yourself uh, near the Soundcheck facility, stop by the uh, SES office and say hello to Kyle. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, everybody listening in. Thank you, Leon. It's been a blast. And uh, uh, I love doing this. Well, thanks so much, Kyle. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a thumbs up and we welcome your comments. Check out more of the Road Dog Project here on YouTube and follow on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Come on, Leon! <laughs>